Uh oh, stall, 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 stall! Holy <laughs> shit, his pants! <laughs> that sucks! He's coming back! Been there, done that! Awesome! Yeah. Great job, Hans! <laughs> Spitfire. <laughs> what? Sweet. Okay. Just so you know, if you just accidentally clicked on this video and you're like, WTH, what is going on here? We just have a good time. Yeah. And that's what you're going to get. If you want hardcore, bare bones information on this AR-10 build, probably not it. We're going to infuse it with some silliness, with some humor, with a lot of philosophy a lot of systems philosophy, and we may take a break to play with some toys along the way. I just do it to Welcome loosen Welcome to the up. TMP bunker. Yeah, it's true. He's so much funnier when he loosens up and just does, doesn't give a crap. Try it. Try. I'm not kidding. Try making fart noises just sometimes. Just do it. To, I'll, <laughs> you'll be sitting in a room and you're like, oh, that is kind of funny. <laughs> it relaxes you. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Cool. Well, we said it strut. before. Both of us don't really like coming in front of the camera. All the stuff we mentioned, but uh, we can do it. And with this gun, we kind of want to do it because we have a lot of things to share with you. This, by the way, is a Focke-Wulf 190 D9 variation. Really awesome plane. If I had a World War II Warbird, as I've said, I would probably prefer this one over everything it's else, fantastic. even a P-51. I'd want a Focke-Wulf D9. Uh, the only thing is, is, I don't know if I could fit in that cockpit. I have sat in a Focke-Wulf 190 cockpit, and it's tight. Have you ever seen it's the, tighter than an ME 109 BF 109? Have you seen that kit plane they have, like a seven eight scale home build? Totally have seen it. That'd be cool. Uh, the coloration on the bottom is actually for AAA probably, so they don't get aced as they strafe the Allied bomber formations, uh, which won World War II. The B-17s, B-24s, accompanied usually by Mustangs. Dude, can you believe This is a great plane, by the way. We're lucky the Germans didn't have a bunch yeah. of these planes with a bunch of great pilots. It would have delayed the outcome of the war. <laughs> their uniforms, we've had this discussion, yeah. their guns, their planes, their tanks, if they just could have focused... <laughs> yeah and not just try to go in 50 different directions. They were just amazing and had a ton of capability if they would have just focused on certain weapon systems. Again, I think the outcome of the war would have been the same way, yeah. but uh, it would have delayed it, probably yeah. by several years, actually. Yeah. Especially if the V-2 had gotten up and running. The V-2 rocket was uh, the beginning of a ballistic missile system, and that would have been ugly. Uh, who makes that, TD? Tell them. 21st Century Toys. There you go. It's crazy. You used to be able to buy this in a Target. Yep. It was on the shelf. It was all disassembled, pre-painted. We didn't do anything to it, so you see like the little... They just had the wing off and you would attach the wing. Isn't that cool? Yeah, it came like this. 21st Century Toys was based in Alameda, California. They primarily focused on some really cool 1-6 scale stuff, which we've had in the background before. Yeah. We don't have any right now. Uh, and we also have Dragon 1-6 scale and uh, what's that other toy company? like? Hobby. A hobby so master. Hot or Toys does some. Yeah, Hot Toys. The, it's super You'll cool. You'll watch the background, you'll see some 1.6 stuff popping it, up. It brought a cool era into focus where it was 1.6. Right. It wasn't the most durable, but it was realistic looking. Yeah. And it was kind of in contrast to Hasbro's more rugged G.I. Joe stuff. But man, they had awesome weapon sets. So I bought this for the boys in about, I don't know, 2003, 2004 time frame. And you're bringing up the point of realism, and that's what I wanted the boys to know. I wanted them to know about historical planes so that they could still play, play just like he's doing right there. He still does that. And, but at the same time, uh, learn about, you know, World War II, what happened, the price of freedom, all that stuff, and to learn equipment. I think it's good to have a working knowledge of tanks, aircraft, guns, knives, all the stuff we talk about here in TMP. And he has, he definitely does. Uh, last suspect, Kinda. less so, kind of. He's just not into it as much as we are. Yeah. Look how cool that paint job is. It's so, awesome. So cool. Uh, these are really big and hard to store, though. You're pretty much relegated to tying them up in your garage or your yep, office. That's right. Otherwise, I, it's going to get snapped. I know a guy who has, he did his theater room, and he's got, I think, the P-51 of these, but... Well, I have a P-51, and we have a P-47 in this scale. And I think we've shown this one before, but we're going to show it again because it's yeah. freaking cool. It's freaking cool. Focke Wolf 190 D9. We have this in 172nd scale. Yeah. There's, there's a, a A8 there. right here. This is, I think, an easy model 1.8 that fell off the shelf and got busted. That's another cool paint job. That, I think that's coming out of uh, probably the Eastern Front against the Russians. That's where this one fought, I think. 
and this is an easy model 172nd scale I think A8 variation great paint job though and as soon as I put it up on the shelf it got bumped and it fell off and it got snapped Ooh, that sucks anywho here we are in the bunker we're gonna have a good time we're gonna share some systems philosophy with you here we appreciate you clicking on the video TD is coming back any second now and he's back and uh, this is an interesting review it's something that I haven't done before and it's gonna be kind of things not to do if you put that back up there please things not to do with your AR-15, AR-10 build according to my mileage. I went to Gunny's, the Great American Gun Store. It was after hours. That's usually when I peruse their shelves. Uh, Wyatt was helping me out and he brought me this AR-10 right here. And he goes, do you want to review this? I had a customer come and sell it to me. It is a mega custom AR-10 and 6.5 Creedmoor. As soon as he said the caliber, I said, hell no, I don't want to review that because I knew I was looking at a $400 ammo bill. We are supported only by our donors. Thank you to TMP Patreon members. You should be one. But I still have to be smart with the, the funds that I'm given and stretch them out because we got a lot of things we, we want to talk about. Yeah, some people don't get that. They don't. You, you go shoot and they're like, all right, wait, what? No more than a thousand rounds on this? And you're like, no, we got to be smart about it. <laughs> they think it's like a blank check. Just 20,000, just burn through it. And That's an interesting point, too. I'll spend just a few few seconds on that point right there of how many rounds to crank through a gun. We used to go really crazy with it. Uh, but the thing I used to do in the reviews is I would test a gun too much. Yeah. I mean, damn, we take it out on 10 outings. And I and it finally dawned on me. I was like, dude, you're getting data after three outings. So we take it on three outings, and I'm done. And however many rounds we crank off in that 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 se those sessions that's that's what it is it's money it's a lot of money and it's time because there's other guns that want to be tested so I, I you know we shoot it enough to get data if and it needs more data or if something went wrong and we want to give it another shot then we'll go take it out again and really like the first little while after you start running it is when you usually find all the headaches I don't think you're gonna sure. have 3,000 trouble free sure. rounds and then on the, the last 500 it starts Because choking. strangely enough in TMP we don't do cat box to peanut butter or peanut butter to cat box testing and other yeah. ridiculous tests trying to get the gun to fail. I mean, there was a time when a lot of uh, gun tubers would do that and I was just I just laughed at it. I thought it was ridiculous. It's just a, a clickbait thing. Yeah. We don't do that. It's just crap. fun to see stuff get destroyed. You know, yeah, we, and the people we click buried on. Oh, this yeah. pistol in a jar of piss for 14 <laughs> days. We pulled we it out. Can it survive? We shot it until the barrel <laughs> turned into a noodle. I mean, people like to see that, but yeah. I'm not interested in that. No, no. Okay, so anyways, back to the gun. Wyatt tells me this gun was sold to him by a customer. He doesn't really know the background of it. But what you're looking at, guys, is a confused build. A confused AR-10 build. We're going to turn the air off. Sorry for the hum. And what I mean by that is the guy who built this AR-10 really didn't know what his philosophy of use was going to be, I think. And we do know this. He spent a shit ton of money. He spent so much money on this build, dude. It's You're looking at high-end stuff. High-end. So we'll have some fun with that, and we're going to talk about some competitive options out of the box that perhaps are more accurate than this, definitely lighter than this. So here we go. Um, it's bunker-style systems philosophy as we pick apart this AR-10. Why did he sell it, Doodle? What would you think? I, th If I had to guess, he didn't necessarily not have a philosophy. I think he, I call it the add-to-cart philosophy. Mm. It's when you build something in abstract and you see it with ARs a lot because the guys don't have the parts in hand. They just start looking and they think, oh, this is cool. This is print. So he kind of went from one thing to another, premium, premium, premium. This is expensive. This is nice. Then once he got it all together, he realized, holy crap, I just built an anchor. This thing weighs 11 and a half pounds, y'all. Let me say that again. He spent how much on this barrel? Uh, 830. $830 is what we found out. We could be a little bit off on it, but close to $800 on this carbon fiber barrel. Because why? Because it's lightweight. And he ended up with a freaking boat anchor almost at 12 pounds. Confused. Confused. And 
I'm going to go out on a limb here and say he sold it because he was not happy with it. Yeah. Either in terms of accuracy, in terms of weight. Uh, you mention all the time that the wife found out he got in trouble with the yeah. wife. That could actually happen, no doubt. But I find that when someone has spent this kind of money, this kind of coin on a gun, they want to hang on to it. They don't want to get rid of it because they know they're not going to get their money out of it. It's like us putting all the accessories on the motorcycles. Do we get our money out of that stuff? It's gone forever. Uh, so here we go. Uh, it's way too heavy overall. Ridiculously heavy. I mean, it, when I lift it up in, in Gunny's shop, I was like, oh my gosh, 6.5 Creedmoor. So that's a big ammo bill, which I'm willing to do if it's a gun that I think serves the purposes of the viewers. And then I lifted it almost 12 pounds. I was like, holy hell, this guy got confused. Um, did you ever find out what muzzle device that is? Mm -mm. We don't know, don't care. So that's not a lightweight, high-tech muzzle device as far as we know. Uh, that is a compensating muzzle device by looking at it. See how the holes around the periphery? So it's going to be super loud. And sure enough, in our testing, it was super loud. Uh, I'm trying to remember the compensation it had. I honestly don't remember, and it doesn't matter because the thing's so heavy. I'm going to so, start one complaint you may see crop up again. It infuriates me when manufacturers do not put logos or names or Agreed. labels on their parts. Ooh, good we get a parts build yeah. and I start digging through going, well, how, what is it? What? Right. There are a right. thousand manufacturers. And honestly, if you don't put anything on there, I'm going to think you just imported it and then right. started selling it by the pallet. I'm totally on board with that. I mean, so here, by the way, he has a, how much is this gun? I forget. It's like, what gunnies is selling it for i mean he's given he's blowing it out the door yeah but i think the guy has over three thousand dollars worth of parts in it probably including the glass maybe up to four thousand but it's funny speaking of labeling things utg gets it yeah <laughs> he put a utg hand hand stop on the bottom of the hand guard they label their stuff and that's a completely decent yeah hand guard but it's a little bit strange to me that here he has everything high end <laughs> no and then he goes and puts a UTG handguard on it. See what I'm saying? It's just confused. If you're going to go high end for second cool and you want to impress all your range buddies, I say go ahead. You know, and, and by the way, if the philosophy of use was for this gun to live at the range and never be a battle rifle of any type you're not carrying around, the weight would actually make kind of some sense. Yeah. Because 11 and a half pounds there at, on the bench, there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually served to your benefit to shoot it better. But I have to think he was thinking about either hunting with it, competing with it, or this is his without rule of law, long range option, because there's a CF barrel on there. Why waste money on a CF barrel unless you plan on carrying the gun around? It, see, it doesn't it make sense. it looks cool, dude. Okay, that's it why. It looks cool. And Doodle rants to me all the time. He's like, you don't understand how important the second cool thing is. And I, I say, yes, I do. I do cover that a lot. The second cool aspect isn't. Uh, you know, of super importance to a lot of people, but I, you know, I sometimes have a hard time wrapping my head around the expense of something like this I when our competitive options are going to be better. I try to explain a lot of guys, it's literally only cool. And then as an afterthought, well, it does its job really well. And this is so in that school of thought, carbon fiber, dude, yeah. 800 bucks. Right, right, it's right. What's the barrel maker again? You research this. Proof research. Proof research. I think I've heard of them. I don't know. There's so many barrel makers. I can't keep up. You can't keep up. But from what we know, this kind of has or at least mimics a heavy barrel profile. You know, because you can see it's pretty thick under the handguard right there. What I can't tell you is how thick that stainless steel barrel liner is. And you didn't find out, did you? Mm -hmm. Did they show you? All it says is heavy contour. I think one to eight. So I've reviewed some Christensen Arms barrels. They look exactly like this. or They're pretty accurate. And they use a relatively thin stainless steel inner on the CF outer. And I'm thinking this one's about the same way. But we really don't know. And judging from the weight, maybe there is more metal in there than, than we know. But it's a 20-inch barrel rifle length gas system. What did he use for his gas block? It's just a standard it 308 like AR-10. Yeah. Screwing gas block. Eh, nothing wrong with that. That's fine. DI gun, obviously. So this is not a piston gun. And then the rail, as far as we know, is a Faxon. I think it's a Faxon Streamline. Uh, Faxon makes some good stuff. It's key mod, so it's not really current in production anymore. So it's kind of hard to track down. Key mod. I would like to know what the underside latch thing is. 
right here. It's, yeah, check this out. So it's got like a spring-loaded finger thing, and it looks like you use that to pop it off. So you'd loosen it and flip it up. But I couldn't uh, find We didn't play with it to find out. That's what she said. Uh, anyways, we like the rail. The rail's cool. Label your shit, people. Yeah, exactly. It has an F on it, so we're thinking Faxon. It has QD cups in the back as if you'd QD this piece. Uh, I guess you could with a two-point sling. The rail's fine. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I would say is it's fine per perhaps for uh, another AR-10 build. Let me let me make a point with this. So if you're going to go out and spend $800 on a carbon fiber barrel, you're, you're telling yourself you want something super lightweight. Oh, by the way, let me bounce back to this. This is not lightweight. This is a chunk of steel. Yeah. So why wouldn't you use a titanium brake? So what I'm saying, if you're going to go lightweight build, something that you go hunting with, or it's got a long range sniping competition with, go light, 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 light. It's the theme through the entire gun. But and, and he deviated more, from that over and over again. I don't get it. Go ahead. But he didn't even just, it's one thing to deviate, but it's another one when everything is expensive. To go expensive, cheap. Expense, eh, we'll cheap out on confused. this and that and that. It's a confused build. That's a really good point. So he's already demonstrated he's willing to spend money on his build, and yet he goes out and puts this on it. I mean, why? Go get a titanium break, dude. Here's an Spend idea. Spend the money. There's some good ones out there, 308 ones. Let me let me look at the- Put a Battle Comp 20, 308 on there. The Go past ahead. scope, this guy had a better condition for this build. Before he traded it in, he grabbed something out of the parts bin, and he kept the better break. Uh, okay, that's- Because that, that would be something I would do. <laughs> okay. But if he did that, why did he leave the damn scope on? Because this scope is pretty yeah. excellent. Why would you leave the scope on in a LaRue SPR 1.5 mount yeah. at about $245? Why? Yeah. So it, that doesn't make, I bet you just turned it in. It's almost like he's running from the law or something. Yeah. Like it just, I'm going to assume that's his break, his choice. I'm going to assume this handguard is his choice. Now, we like we said, we didn't take the handguard off and weigh it. I would, we just weren't motivated to do that. But I would have gone with the absolute lightest handguard for an AR-10 that I could have gotten away with. And I probably wouldn't have gone with one this long because, again, I'm assuming your CF barrel is setting the entire tone for the build. And let's make a point with this. Uh, TM Pierce asks me all the time, hey, man, they'll run components by me. And I tell them the heart of your AR-15, the heart of your AR-10 is your barrel. Spend money on your barrel because a good barrel will shoot well. You'll be happy with it. Bad barrels, not so much. And plus, you can get a super heavy barrel that shoots so-so. Be smart about your barrels. All our AR-15 builds will will show that. I don't have any in the background, but we'll talk about this gun. Well, that's the MCX. That's a great barrel on that gun, by the way. No, so the barrel is setting the tone for this gun, and now he has, I believe, probably too heavy of a handguard on it. Let me make a point here, because recently, and this is this summer, I bought two Faxon handguards. I wasn't able to weigh them. And I got back to the shop. I weighed them. And I was like, whoa, they're heavier than I thought. But check this out. <clears throat> they make one in carbon. Okay. Maybe that's what he should have put on. It's like $300, though, I think. He's already spent a lot of money, though. Who he, cares? He totally should have jumped for it. Should have jumped for it. So I took those two Faxon handguards back because my uh, BCM handguards are lighter than that. And they're just as strong, if not stronger. And that rail is the KMR, right? Yeah, the KMR. BCM. And also Midwest Industries makes some amazing rails we've put on yeah. our builds. And they're lightweight. They're cost effective. Point being, if you're going to go lightweight, go lightweight. Go lightweight. Get something super skeletonized. Now, one thing I'll say in his defense, because I don't want this to be a complete rail session on the dude whoever built this, is we don't know what time frame he built this in. So I'm not really sure what was available because the handguard progression has been pretty steep. Yeah. And pretty quick in the last like five years it's improved like to get lighter and cooler and more skeletonized there's some amazing handguards out there we had key mod and for about two years it got into everything You're everyone right. modernized right. and then next thing you know hey get the baby dick rail out of here i don't want it <laughs> it's gone <laughs> it's on clearance and now you can get these for a lot you know you find right. clearance halls all the time well and we're gonna have a bunch of links below of components that we like so and we're asked this all the time in tmp hey what handguard what grip what barrel? Well, guess what? We'll put a ton of links down there. And if you click on our links, we get 2.3 cents. And I'm hoping to make enough dollar bills so I can fill a bathtub in it, strip down naked, and just roll around in them. That would be awesome. Cool. Thanks for that visual image, Nutton. We really appreciate it. 
Okay, so that's the barrel. We'll look at how this barrel shot here soon enough. Now we go on to the optic. The optic is actually probably the best part of this AR-10 build in 6.5 Creedmoor. This is a Leopold V6. It is SKU 171581 as far as we know. It's an illuminated, really nice Leopold, long range scope, four to 24, which by the way is a fantastic power range for long range shooting. It's awesome. And we've said that so many times on camera, in the field, from the hill, tactical doodle shooting with me. We don't like short power optics for long range, like a six power max, 10 power max. We're like, no. Every time we go and take a crew member out, we give them a 700 yard shot or something like that, they're cranking it all the way up. So get something that has that power range that you can really discern the target. You can see your wobble in the crosshairs that way. If you fight heat mirage, uh, heat mirage coming off the barrel, of course, there's a CF barrel. One of the advantages it won't have quite as much then deal with it, dial down, but it's a variable power scope. So we love the scope, even though it's not ultimately heavy, it's 22 and a half ounces, Leopold 171581, but it's firepower versus mobility. And really, I mean, it, soon enough, we'll have a new fad in which you won't use optics at all. It'll be a red dot with multiple magnifiers behind it. And you just flip them on and decide how much <laughs> magnification you need at any time. That has its own set of downfalls, though. You know this. He's being facetious. Uh, and you have standard dials here, so you push up. You can uh, re-zero them. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't have like uh, zero stop dials in it, though. So I guess that's kind of a miss. I I love Leopold optics. I've reviewed them, and they are recommended. And this is an illuminated option. So good job on the scope. 52 millimeter objective. Super clear. Nice uh, reticle on it. I'm not sure what that it's reticle the is called. Varmint reticle, if I remember right. Well, maybe that's uh, inside of what he was building this for then. So if he's put a varmint reticle on, there's so many reticles. Killing rats with six <clears throat> five creed. Now the optic mount. What do you think of that? The Leopold. We talked talked about its cost, but how about the mount itself? Tactical doodle. Uh, I'm kind yeah. of cooled. On yeah, that's LaRue how I stuff. feel about LaRue's stuff as well. I mean, the, the QD stuff is cool, but there's much lighter stuff that's more affordable. Yeah, we go with the Aero Precision. Yeah. 30 millimeter mount. It's way lighter. It's 85 bucks. Dude, it blows this mount away. One thing I really hate about the LaRue mounts is they're very hard to get your scope straight up and down. It seems like every time you start tightening them, they twist a lot. We do have some Arasaka scope shims that we'll put in the bottom. And if you have a flat scope bell like this Leopold does, you can do that and it does help. I love that thing. That's cool. And a side tightening mount like a LaRue, that, that's the way to go. So get some Arasaka aluminum triangular shims. And what they do is they straighten that scope out. But for the price and the weight, they're so 2007, right? So uh, there's better options, and but that's what he what he went with. Another thing which is interesting about this build is I don't know if he was influenced by maybe a forum or a review because these are always popular mounts, right? Yeah. I've cooled on them. You've cooled on them in the last, I don't know, eight or so years. We really pulled back from the real light. We found a lot better cost-effective, higher performing options and they just overprice all their stuff. It's insane. So we don't recommend them anymore. Not to mention they mar the shit out of your stuff sometimes. Oh, they do. They're harsh. That finish is a really, uh, it's a matte finish he puts on the, the mount and it's good. It's a matte anodizing, but it will, it mars your scope well, a lot. Well, just the act of having the levers on the side too and you open it up, I notice it. Which I guess if you're an optimist, you like that you're marking your optic position on there. But for something like this, where you've got a different finish, it's just, it's Looks a little like more wear than down I would want. Well, keep this in mind too, because we're, we're staying consistent as we analyze this AR-10 in 6.5 Creedmoor. And the consistent message is this guy wanted it light, and yet he did not choose the ultimate yeah. light 30 millimeter scope mount. So not good, not good. The SPR 1.5 is not that light. I'm trying to go off memory what they are. I want to say like six ounces or 5.8 ounces, but no, I, I, I you can do better. We don't know the time frame though, so we'll give him a little bit of pass here. I love that rear non-sight he's got. Do you know what that is? This cheesy leveler. Yeah, that's so he makes sure the gun is level before he takes that 1,200 yard shot. So that's a level bubble, anti-camp bubble. It's labeled extreme. At least they labeled that one. That's cool. Uh, it's funny here in TMP, after all the long range we've done, and we're not long range experts. We're not acting like we are. 
were hacks. Uh, but we can hit. I mean, seven, eight hundred yards you've seen on camera over and over again. We can hit. I mean, like within one, two, three shots, we're on target with the dope that will compute with our software. Um, we've never used one of these. That's my point. We've never used one. We've never put an anti-cant level on a scope. And I just, I don't know. I've thought about it. Like, maybe we should put that on. And I'm just like, yeah, whatever. I, your, go ahead. I do suppose that there's a little channel in there somewhat that you could use to maybe have backup Buis or something, but it really doesn't yeah. look like that, which seems like a missed opportunity. I think it you is have for BUIS. Right in that spot. Why not? Yeah. Whatever. And he didn't put BUIS on this, nope. which is fine. I, I'm not going to criticize that. I mean, if he's intending this to be a long range piece, uh, we've done that as well. I'm surprised he didn't have 45 degree irons on it though, because that would have been in vogue. <laughs> well, then we get to the realm of ridiculousness because this is a long range setup. If you put 45 degree irons on it, then that's kind of a three gun setup. Kind of. And, I mean, you can make the case, well, you know, he wants an iron backup, but from the crosshair, which we forgot about when you mentioned it, maybe this is a varmint setup for him or a hunting setup. Uh, nice charging handle. I love his charging handle. I love handle. that. The Raptor. Really good. Yeah, it's a Raptor by a Axtis or AXTS. Yeah, it's about 90 bucks. Yeah, and there's so many good charging handles. Again, we'll put some yeah. links down. If you're interested, you're doing a build and you're just like, hey, what, what would you recommend? We like these, so the double throw charging handles like that, and the ones that are stronger against your upper receiver. Uh, uh, speaking of receivers, here we go. Uh, what pattern is this? Is this DPMS? It's, um, I think DPMS so, DPMS yeah. pattern, right? Billet. 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 The mountain. What do we say about billet receivers? I know they don't remember. Let me help you out. I'm going to pretend that guy is, is in the audience that always pays attention and remembers everything. You say they're too damn heavy, nothing fancy. Thank you. Right. Clap for you. We don't like billet, billet usually because they just add weight. Now, they're going to be stylistic. You can do all the milling you're seeing here. So the upper is billet. The lower is billet. And this, again, is in the now defunct and absorbed by who? Zev. Zev brand, uh, Mega Custom, upper and lower. So billet, and you can see it's Duracoated in, uh, I don't know, that whatever color that's called, the silver charcoal color. Um, not that they're horrible, but I think this is one reason this gun is so heavy, because it is using not forged components, but billet receivers. Yeah. Now, if you're a billet fan, you love a billet billet and you have it in your build, uh, that's fine, but try to find one of your buddies that has a, a ready made out of the box forged upper and lower AR-10 and weigh it. And I bet you that forge is going to be lighter Yeah. because even though they've made an attempt here in Mega Custom to really mill it out and lose some weight here, it's still heavier. Like look at this big chunk of metal surrounding the magazine well. Why do you need that? So it's still around in stores in some places, but okay. I don't know if it's... 600 bucks for the upper and lower. You other. are kidding me. 600. And it's called the, the Mountain, M-A-T-E-N. Wow. I'm not sure. Yeah. So I'm going to give a big thumbs down to the upper and lower choice, at but least for a lightweight out. build. If it's a bench rest build, I say, okay, go ahead. This will change your Hold mind. Hold that side. I got this one. It weighs 28 ounces. Oh my gosh. I, I rest my case. It. I knew you'd love it. Bammo. That's exactly what I was talking about. Damn, 28 ounces just for the upper? Upper and lower together. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's still heavy. It's that, Dude, bad. that's still heavy. And we think he put a Strike Industries magazine extension. I think so. Right I've got that same that's one. Strike. Uh, I have it on one of my guns, and they're pretty inexpensive. They're cool. I like the pop of red. Yeah. It looks cool. You know, a little technical. Dust cover, no four charging, uh, which I don't have a problem with. You don't need it. And then we go to this side of the receiver. Standard AR-10. Uh, and then we go back to this one to say something good, at least in terms of quality and reliability. Look at the name on the BCG. Dude, I love that carrier. That is awesome. I believe that's a JP Enterprises uh, nickel boron coated AR-10 carrier. I'm going to crack it open and show it to him. Go ahead. it looks freaking... When I pulled that it out, I was tight. Like... I'll say the upper and lower fit really tight. Do you need my cadet? Uh, I bet you do. I bet you do, dude. I like this choice. <laughs> Look at this, dudes. JP Enterprises AR-10 Bolt Carrier Group. I believe that is nickel boron coated. Look at that. That is a work of art. 
JP always does that. It's such a great choice. And this one feels pretty light. So for this build, for any Air 10 build, I say rock on, man. I will it's a good choice. Go ahead. POF is uh, doing some cool stuff because I know theirs uses a 5.56 bolt carrier. Right. And, and I have reviewed that. Oh, buddy. Yeah. So I, that's. The Revolution's cool. It's awesome. Um, that is still kind of getting improved generationally, though. The yeah. Revolution BCG. This is more of an established size. But this one, I didn't weigh it, but it feels light. Feels light. And we'll say here in the bunker that. If you're going to lose weight, uh, do it in your handguard, do it in your barrel, do it in your receivers. Oh, here we go. We do have one. Yeah. Awesome. We do have a scale here sitting right in front of our face. Yeah, lose weight in those other areas. I generally try not to lose it in my bolt carrier group within reason. I mean, I'm not going to go for a heavy BCG just for the heck of it. Um, but the skeletonized ones and ones where you have to dick around with your buffer spring, the buffer and your reliability uh, goes away. Generally not worth it. You lose the weight in your handguard, your barrel, your receivers. 14.6 ounces. It's like when you're allergic to something, but instead of not eating what you're allergic to, you keep taking meds to cover up the side effects. Yeah, it's like that. And you have a cascading thing. And That's next thing exactly you know, you're, what it you're is. counting how many coils. Well, could I cut the spring off? What kind yeah. of amp? It backs you into a corner. So this is a great BCG choice, and I'm sure it's pricey. I didn't price it out, but JP stuff ain't cheap. It ain't free, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah it's great. Easy to clean. It's just fantastic. So uh, good choice with that. I mean, it, it couldn't be any better. Now, the trigger we think is either a Timney or an AR Gold. It's a modular trigger, ventilated rib, trigger face. Uh, we have both Air Gold and we have both Timney, and they look like this. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, it pulls really good. It's a good trigger. I wouldn't do anything with a trigger, so we've got no criticisms for his trigger choice. And I like modular triggers. Uh, the only thing I would say is add an anti-walk pin kit to this, yeah. maybe. I mean, they're cheap. They're like 12 bucks. Um, we're putting them on all our guns little by little. And then the grip is an MOE. Yeah, it's like the cheapest part of... All of them. I like MOE. I, I don't really like the rubber covered ones though, like this one is for every everything we've said in the past. Uh, but the grip angle is fine. It's not the ultimate lightweight grip though. Again, we see a confusion going on here. If you want, you know, ultimate lightness, don't go with MO, MOE rubber covered grip. 3.8 pounds just for this section right here with no mag. 3.8 pounds. Okay. Uh, do you want to talk about the stock? Uh, I was going to mention the JP Silent Spring. So oh, it's yeah. got the, the buffer system in there. Dude, that's cool. It's cool. Uh, but guess what? It's heavy. Yeah. And I've talked about that in some tabletops. So if you don't know what we're talking about, this is a, a modular spring system by JP. And we have installed them in some AR-15s, and we really like them, but they add weight. Yeah. Now, I don't fault JP at all for this because he has a competition focus. Three gun. You know, so weight really isn't that important. You know, the guy's running 100 feet, maybe. Yeah. So it's not really a combat focus. And that BCG we just showed you, that's, uh, they say not to use that for what, self-defense or something yeah. like that for I really, combat operations. I really JP like that does. too. It yeah, says, cool. hey, precaution, it's a def competition. It's a competition piece. It's not up to you. Not issues, but I would much rather have that than the greatest defensive implement yeah. you could possibly buy. JP's cool, man. I liked him when I met him and down to earth dude. He makes some good kit, but that's a silent spring system. If you, if you want to eliminate the twang of the recoil, that's one way to do it, but you're adding weight. Like we said, this whole unit here is three pounds, eight ounces. Now the stock. Okay. Take this, it away. Doodle. This is, this is one, the first time we've seen the stock on camera in yeah. detail that I've talked about it. You've talked about it. Yeah. We haven't had many around and people ask a lot. What do you think about the UBR? I do suspect part of its popularity comes from the fact that, uh, I think it was the Army. They published a guide about running 20-inch uppers mm -hmm. on carbine lowers. Right. And for some reason, they chose this as the graphic. Mm. So a lot of people see that and go, dude, it's, it's what the military uses. Cool. It's kind of heavy. That's the thing. It goes great with the M5 Raz because yeah. it will kill you. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, the UBR is cool, but it's, it's more for bench rest and for competition, says and me. I'm a little confused as to why I did it on this, because it doesn't have the adjustability you'd expect for someone who's going all out precision rifle when they have, you know, the PSG type where you got the adjustable comb okay. and you can dial it yeah. in back to front. Right. But 
if he's going for it, like we're talking a varmint, a varmint yeah. or hunting philosophy of use, then I can understand it. And the the actual the comb height on this with that scope and SPR 1.5 mount, it works. I mean, it's not out of whack at all. Yeah. But I see a lot of guys putting on those fully adjustable uh, uh, rear butt stocks to be cool, and they don't really use that adjustment. When something like this would work. Uh, the bottom line on the UBR, from what we know right now, all subject to change, is we would never put this on a gun we were going to war with. It's just too damn heavy. It's too heavy. It's too damn heavy. Uh, if I'm in a sniper competition and I have to hike five miles, I still wouldn't put it on. I'd go with an MFT or something lightweight. Yeah. Um, it's cool looking. It looks rad. It's comfortable. It's really strong. It's got some cool features. You know, a QD cup, sling loop right here. Comes in different colorations. But the weight, it's a non-starter. Again, we get to the confusion of this build. So he puts on a UBR. How do you put on an MFT? I'd go, oh, okay. You know, and the MFT, we're not saying is like perfect. Uh -uh. We don't think we It's have just one the here. lightest of the pack right now. Oh, yeah, you got one right there. Yeah, so Sweet. is that an MFT? Yeah, 12, I think. There you go. That's what I would run. Even on a precision rifle, if weight is important. And again, if you're going to spend $800 on a carbon fiber barrel, I would think weight is important. I really wish he would have put a sticker on his gun like we do on ours so he would have told us what he was uh, thinking. That would have been cool. Hey, guys, this is what I'm thinking when I put this gun together. But compare. So weight-wise, the MFT is, is it 5.5 ounces? I forget right off, but the UBR it's super is, light. The UBR is 21. Good. Although I think that includes the, uh, the tube. Because I'm pretty sure this uses a, yeah, a longer right. tube. Uh, and it's just insane. Now, again, if your application is bench rest, competition, uh, and you need that weight for stability, I say go with the UBR because it's a great stock in, in terms of ergonomics. It's really nice. We like the stock. But otherwise, uh, maybe not. Maybe not. That's cool. It's got preset, I guess. Oh, that works. You got a little door thing, too. So oh, that's put, right. You can put little knickknacks yeah. in there. Your Skittles. Skittles or condoms. Yeah. Or, okay. So, guns back together. There's your features review on the Mega Custom. We think Proof Research Custom AR-10 build. Now, the big, big question is this. How did it shoot? Did it impress you in the Nut and Fancy project? Well, let's take a look. If I'm going to spend this type of money in a gun, put this type of barrel in a gun, this type of BCG in a gun, put this type of glass in a gun, <laughs> shoot this caliber, which yeah. is very accurate, 6.5 Creedmoor, uh, usually we're pushing, I think, like 140 grainers. I want to see half MOA with really good stability. Um, I didn't see that. I didn't see that. So here we go. There's a group with a Mega Custom. There's another group. That's larger than MOA. It's operational from the desert, but I achieve sub MOA out there all the time doing it. Uh, Doodle wasn't with me when I shot this one. Yeah, so um, I, I won't use the word disappointing really because those aren't horrible groups, but I was like, wow, I thought this thing would do better. You know, and so I probably pushed uh, on one outing like 100 rounds through it, on another outing another 100. And uh, I'll just show you some of the paper. These are a little bit better. And I say federal, uh, all good pulls, and I have 21 power selected. And I think that it was windy that day too. So I'm giving an up arrow right here, Tactical Doodle, right yeah. there. That's pretty good right there. That's sub MOA, MOA, but we're not seeing the holes touching. I kind of want to see the holes touching yeah. with this type of money. What I'm seeing here with this type of grouping is just a, a good to excellent AR-10 build. So maybe I will use the word disappointing. What do you guys think? I mean, for this money, and all these are good pulls, good stability. I'm not shaking or baking. This thing should have shot better than it did, and it didn't. So, hmm. I think the oh reliability was good though. The reliability was 100%. I not have any stoppages at all. So I'm going to give it credit where credit is due. Go ahead. What were you going to say? It's just. I suspect the guy at some point realized he had spent all this money to get something which lost a lot of value and mm -hmm. didn't perform as well as something like a SCAR 20. Right. He thought, well, I could have gotten, oh man, it's turnkey. Yeah. It's all in. There's so many turnkey AR-10 or 
AR-10-ish systems that you could have got for much less money than this. He, this guy wasted so much money in the end. He came out with a gun that's too damn heavy and is not supremely accurate. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. Not supremely accurate. And he's rocking a 20-inch barrel. You're rocking a 20-inch barrel, bro. So that accuracy should be smoking. All right, competitive options. Doodle loves this one. Now, this is not a revolution. This is a renegade. So this, this is the uh, mainstay of TMP in a lot of ways because it shows how a manufacturer should do a direct gas impingement AR-15 out of the box. It doesn't need nothing. Well, near nothing. Uh, I put a couple changes on this, but generally not too much. So this is a Renegade 5.56 AR-15, but their revolution, which I have reviewed, I don't have it, has been improved. Doodle, yeah. talk to him about it. Dude, you can get a 6.5 Creedmoor 20-inch barrel DI, at least according to the website, for 8.3 pounds. 8.3 pounds, dude. And that has all their upgrades with the bolt carrier group, with their heat dissipation features yeah. that they have, has a great trigger in it. Uh, you don't have to do much, if anything at all, to that POF revolution. Uh, I'm trying to get a hold of a POF revolution, the latest generation to review it, because the one I reviewed once upon a year, it was great, it was reliable, but it was not ultimately accurate. And I'm hoping uh, that they've improved it. And I'm, tr I'm trying to remember which ver variation I reviewed, but uh, I, was, I was prompting them to do a direct gas impingement AR-10, and yeah. lo and behold, they've done it. So I'm super stoked with that. Uh, maybe we, we do another review, but they're really hard to get a hold of. I'm surprised. Right now. They really and I don't go to POF directly. Uh, I have to get it through Gunnies, a great American gun store. Uh, another competitive option is something that, hold that paper up again, that shoots just as good as this. Okay, remember this paper. Okay, here comes a Palmetto PA-10, and it's wearing an ATN night scope on it. It's an X X Sight 4K going through testing. I know you guys are excited. Stand by for the tabletop. Uh, it's not perfect. It's got some big downsides, but it is affordable night vision. But this PA-10 by Palmetto, stainless steel barrel, that muzzle device we put on it. Dude, it shoots as good as this one does. <laughs> it shoots as good as a 4000 AR-10 we're looking at here in the bunker. I just put a CTR on it because, you know, it was left over. Yes. There's one of those triggers I talked about. I think that one is a Timney. I'd have to see. I might have written it down. This is a great gun. What do you think? Do you like it? Yeah. Show the, do I have uh, paper from that? No. Check this out too. Another turnkey option that we just took down from the back wall. <laughs> it's been here forever. Is a SIG 716 Gen 2. This is its group. From the box. SIG 716 Gen 2. Do that. Uh, any number of AR-10s. Uh, how about the Smith & Wesson MMP-10? Not overly impressive, but I'm shooting mostly FMJ loads here, dudes. So there's a 150 FMJ. That's an AE load, and it's not very accurate. Seller and Bellet shot like that. Gold medal match. I was a little bit disappointed here. But, I mean, it's not as accurate as a Mega Custom, but dang, son, it's a lot cheaper, a lot lighter, a lot more combat ready. What do you think? Yeah. I just, I don't know. I like knowing, and I'm probably more particular than you about it, but I like knowing that I can, if I need to, liquidate a firearm and come out at least more or less where I was when I went into it. Right. I really hate losing a bunch of money on an impulse buy. Right. And this, it reeks of it. Yep. Oh, by the way, I did find a PA-10 target. Here you go. There you Look go. at that. So that's shooting as good, <laughs> as good as this expensive, heavy, build. So what have we learned, kids, here in the bunker? We have learned this, and we're being serious with this, yeah. is have an idea of what you're doing in your build. What is your philosophy of use? Answer the question, do I care about weight? Maybe you care about weight in the opposite way we do. Maybe you want a heavy gun for bench rest, for competition shooting. That's a different philosophy of use and it's completely valid. Most people will care about weight because they're thinking about without rule of law, which we see approaching apparently day by day when we are filming this. I think that's why a lot of guys like a heavy hitter, which we call sopper, semi-automatic precision rifles. If that's the case, focus on lightweight to a reasonable degree. I don't think $800 for a barrel is reasonable. Do you tactical do No, not at all. That's not reasonable. You can go with a lightweight profile or mid-profile barrel 
You don't have to go 18 inch. You can do a 16 inch build, put a you know lightweight muzzle device on it and you'll be so much happier for it. Just use that theme to guide you in your build. So handguard should be lightweight. Use forge upper and lower. There's some good parts out there. Palmetto's one. Uh, use a good, you know, buttstock. It's common sense, really. But don't get lost with your add to cart. Yeah. You know, and end up with a monstrosity like this, where it really is confused. It really doesn't know what it is. Go ahead. I just, I think it's funny because it happens so often. It's, huh, 80 bucks for a bolt. This one's 240. Yeah. I'm going to go 240. Awesome. Yeah. It's going to end up perfect. Now, when we are filming this, it's crazy days. So finding any AR-10, AR-15 at your gun store is really, really difficult. We don't know what the future holds. Uh, it could be bad, but we have to kind of pretend when we talk about an out-of-box solution that you will find them and they are available. If so, and I tell this to guys, uh, you know, like email me and message me in Patreon, I say, buy one of our reviewed solutions. They'll go, hey, what do you think about such and such AR-10? And it might be one I have not reviewed yet. And I'm like, well, I've reviewed a lot. Why don't you just go to one of the yeah. ones I've reviewed? You know, we spent a lot of money and time reviewing those. I don't know why they always have to go out in front of the project and get something that we don't have data on. They're like, what do you think of this? And I'm like, well, did you already buy it? And he's like, yeah, I did. I'm like, well, what's it shoot? He goes, I'm getting about two inches at 100 yards. I'm like, well, you can wait for the review. Uh, we can only do so much. I mean, there's only so much bandwidth we have in the project, almost, only so much uh, you know, content we can push through, but we have a lot of AR-10 content out there. My number one option, if, if you want something good, is buy something like a PA-10. You know, buy something like a, Se a SIG 716 Gen 2 uh, or something like that that is really squared away, and you don't have to do anything to it, and only if and when you want to tweak this, tweak that, you can do it. Well, that does it from the bunker, talking about the mega custom AR-10 build and actually some AR-10, AR-15 build advice of sorts from the Nut and Fancy Project to our friends, our subscribers, and our donors. Thanks so much, guys and gals, for watching the video, for clicking on it, for putting up with our silliness at times. Hopefully, this has helped you in your building or your purchasing. We're going to sign off with another aircraft. Here we go. Tactical Doodle style. What is that? Sick. V-22 Osprey. Get ready to rope. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> is he going to stall it? <laughs> oh, crap. Here it goes again. <laughs> Uh-oh. He's reaching. Max performance, service ceiling. He can't go any higher. <laughs> Bro, he saved it. It's back. Yeah, they Thanks said this being... thing was unsafe. <laughs> Thanks for being part of the donation community and for supporting us throughout the years. Good luck with your builds, your shooting. Uh, stay safe out there. Yeah. Good luck finding ammo. Yeah, really. Seriously. Bye now.